um, CEO of a large company. I have been uh, Secretary of Defense. I have been the Chief of Staff. Uh, the Vice Presidency is mostly a uh, symbolic job. Right, right. Wartime presidents, very popular. I was writing for SNL, Saturday Night Live, and I was always intrigued by Cheney. There was this kind of stand-up comic joke, like, oh, he's pulling the strings. But no one really thought much about it. And then I ended up doing a show with Will Ferrell on Broadway that was called You're Welcome, America, and it was a one-man show about George W. Bush. And I just kept thinking about Cheney, and I was like, there's something else here. There is no doubt that Saddam Hussein now has weapons of mass destruction. He was not particularly charismatic from a personality perspective. He came from an unassuming background. People know that he wielded influence, but they don't really know a lot about his life. Where did he go to college? You know, that he was in the Ford administration, the Reagan administration, the Herbert Walker Bush administration. Dick, I just want to say thank you for getting the House not to override the president's veto or well, the Ferris Doctrine. Not a problem. Happy to get rid of any big government regulations. When you do the research, you realize that this is an ascension to power that has taken place over many decades and that it was incredibly strategic. Cheney's always looking three steps ahead. How much was he seeing? What was he imagining? He was phenomenally brilliant at being able to understand the machine of government. He went from being in the drunk tank to being the youngest White House chief of staff in 11 years. That is amazing. Your father is chief of staff. And then later in life, coming to be possibly the most powerful vice president that has ever existed. We will also be receiving the daily intelligence briefing before the president. That gets us inside the decision curve. Bush approved all of this? We have a um, understanding. He was able to navigate and infiltrate this world in an incredibly savvy way. I don't think there are many people in America that would hear about being VP and think of it as an opportunity. But Cheney was so smart, he understood the layers of the bureaucracy in Washington, D.C. And only he would have been smart enough to realize that VP is how the president categorizes it. The vice presidency is also defined by the president. And if we were to come to uh, different understanding. Cheney in his discussions with W. Bush started carving out this idea of a different understanding and started using phrases like that with Bush. Yeah, sounds good. And I believe this can work. <laughs> and cut. You got this. I'm happy. Adam had done a lot of extensive reading and research about Cheney, and he had talked to us about his interest in telling an epic story on a grand scale that would also help people understand things that are quite complicated. I love the way Adam told this true story. He takes it to a very basic level of understanding of where moments change in history that were swept completely under the rug that we may completely have forgotten about or not even known. So I don't think this story could have been told this well to this degree without him. The unexpected is Adam's signature. I'm having a heart attack, you idiot. That's the sort of thing that Adam does so well. He'll take a very dark subject matter and put a comical spin to it. I wouldn't even say comedic, because while funny, it's also terrifying. I do like a good puppet show. I say we do it. Adam also believes in the absurd and in calling out these moments of horror or tragedy or coincidence for how absurd they really are. They don't fit into the narrative we've been fed. By all accounts of what people saw in that room on that terrible day, there was confusion, fear, uncertainty. But Dick Cheney saw something else that no one else did. He saw an opportunity. Having the conceit of a narrator, it's wonderful because it allows you to learn in a way that you weren't expecting. 
I felt like a big part of this movie is how did your average American react to this story? How were we affected by what's going on? It's one thing to tell a story in a political vacuum, but I feel like it always has to be counterbalanced by how was it affecting us? So pretty quickly in the early days of the movie, it became apparent that our narrator was gonna be America. He has a job, he has a certain kind of life. He's in the military at a given moment. He is the yin to the Chinese yang in a way. And I think it is another way to keep the movie really light on its feet and playful and able to tell you complicated things without getting bogged down in a ton of exposition. So with one of the biggest media and political machines ever created behind him, Cheney was able to squash action on global warming, cut taxes for the super rich, and gut regulations for massive corporations. There's a reveal that not only does the narrator work a warehouse job, not, o not only does he go to war, but he ends up making a giant sacrifice in the end, which uh, I view as kind of the sacrifice that America made in a way. Adam, I think, can write and direct scenes that are both grounded and real, while at the same time possess a degree of absurdity. We can't just snap into a Shakespearean soliloquy that dramatizes every feeling and motivation. <laughs> That's just not the way the world works. If you look at recent cultural history in America, we don't talk about power a lot anymore and the addictive nature of power, the corruptive nature of power. And I think whenever you go back to that, the person who's written the best about it is Shakespeare. My sweet Richard, dancing in the round the king's heart thou hath. Shakespeare was a student of the human soul and power and the perils of reaching too high and the need to balance ambition with family. You know, those are things that Shakespeare was dealing with. The biggest mystery to me was when he got that call from W. Bush to be vice president. Hello. And I kept wondering what was in his mind. So I started imagining this Shakespearean scene where he told his wife, this is our time. For too long, I was second fiddle. Because I always thought Lynn wouldn't have liked this. Lynn would have thought the vice presidency was a, a joke of a job. But Cheney was so smart, he knew what it could be. And it just very naturally in writing the scene became Shakespearean. That's bogus Shakespeare, courtesy of me and my daughter. Thou shared thy torch's flame with mine, revealing halls and spires of long faded empires. And now I may hold aloft mine own fiery crescent. That little dose of Shakespeare is my favorite scene I think I've ever shot. Uh, Christian and I, I think I harassed him on set to practice for like weeks with me and we would just start saying it. Cause the scene as we shot it was much longer. Bringing a Shakespeare vernacular into the film reminds everybody that even though this was in our time, these things have been happening forever. So. So I think we uh, proceed. The U.S. doesn't torture. Therefore, uh, if the U.S. does it, by definition, it can't be torture. When Cheney started redefining a lot of the legal terms that are the foundation of America, basically, especially with torture, surveillance, enemy combatants, all of this stuff was done in a very dry, quiet way. So how do you make this interesting to an audience? This is life-changing stuff. This redefines the position of America in the world. Cheney, after 9-11, was just unfettered. He could do whatever he wanted to do. And and it felt like a bunch of power hungry guys at a table just going, give us your best menu. Good evening, gentlemen. Tonight we're offering the enemy combatant, whereby a person is neither a prisoner of war nor a criminal and therefore has no protection under the law. The scene takes place in a very posh restaurant where some leading members of the uh, Bush administration are meeting. And in keeping with the whole kind of satirical tone of the movie, my job is basically to give them the specials. But of course, the specials turn out to be not uh, alternatives to the menu, but alternatives of how to basically organize a war. And we also have a very delicious and fresh 
War Powers Act interpretation, which gives the executive branch broad powers to attack nations or people who it deems still possibly a threat. Oh, that sounds delicious. These things that Alfred is talking about as his specials are horrible human atrocities, and it's done with such whimsy that you can't help but laugh, but also feel sort of sick at the same time. <laughs> The scene in the restaurant is one of my favorite things. <laughs> it's the way that he explains something in an unexpected way that sort of challenges you to pay attention. Because like, wait a second, what does the waiter say? And suddenly you're paying attention and you're absorbing the information. That's kind of the game of the whole movie is, you know, trying to get people to go with this stuff that if you were just told it or read it in a newspaper article, you'd be bored. So, gentlemen, which would you like? Well, have more. Right from the beginning when I was writing the script, I did not want someone doing an impersonation of Chaney. And then about halfway through the script, I started realizing this is the most mysterious, difficult to peg character I've ever worked on, and there's only one guy who can do it. It has to be Christian Bale. Well, my first thought was that Adam was batshit crazy, right, in coming to me. Loving the idea of the challenge, but thinking, nah, it's beyond me. There were a number of texts between myself and Adam where I was saying, you bastard. Do you realize how much hard work this is going to be? You have authorization to shoot down any aircraft deemed a threat. There was never, in Adam's mind, anybody else other than Christian. If he didn't want to do it, I couldn't tell you what plan B would have been. My experience with Christian Bale on The Big Short was that he doesn't just do an impersonation of people. He actually breaks them apart and puts them back together again, and that's what I wanted. I think he's one of those actors that could do anything. He never seemed to be breaking a sweat. Fortunately, he was very, very intrigued, and he and I talked about it, and I talked about how this is really a mystery, this is really something we have to solve together, and he does crazy research for every character. So he was totally on board. The deal that Adam and I made was I said to him, what I'm gonna do is try as much as I can to come at it from a positive point of view and absolutely embrace Cheney's own politics with uh, sincerity. What's it gonna be? Is it a, a yes or a no? So yes. You don't even know what the question is, do you? I'm assuming no, it's No, 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 it's okay. It's exactly the kind of yes I was looking for. This man has always been an actor that loses himself in a role, and this, I've, he's unrecognizable, and the performance is so spot on, it's so incredible. Really felt like Christian was a collaborator in making this movie. He kept challenging me as the filmmaker and asking questions and beating me up as far as like what my interpretation of Cheney was. So when you mix that with his physical transformation, his research, the fact that he's playing it, he really became a major collaborator in this movie. There's no interest to me if I'm bringing my own politics into this. I'm, I should be a vessel and I should absolutely embrace and adopt and find the good and the sincerity in all of Cheney's politics. You know, I'm into like a- Spit it out, what are you trying to say? Against us? What do we believe? What do we believe? <laughs> <laughs> what do we believe? Oh, that's very good. What do we believe? <laughs> Everyone told us that Lynn steers the boat, that Lynn is the one who's in charge. I think Lynn was the wind in his sails. She was literally the ambition. When I heard that Adam uh, was interested in me reading this part and an opportunity to work with Christian again, that was so attractive. And then when I read it, Lynn seemed like an impossible challenge, not only the way that she traverses age from 20 to 70, but also creating an empathetic character who at the same time has like a laser focus Focus and giving her truth and respect. Lynn was very tricky, so I needed someone who was strong because Lynn is, she's such an extreme character. Either you stand up straight and you get your back straight and you have the courage to become someone or I'm gone. This is the third time working with Amy. She's one of the f absolute finest and boldest actresses out there. And so we have a great relationship in terms of when the cameras start rolling, of how comfortable we feel. What can you say about Amy Adams? She can do anything. She's funny. There's great mystery around her. Amy really dug into what she saw as the origins and humanity of Lynn Cheney. You are not going anywhere, do you hear me? 
For me, it's always this person and their family are going to watch this film. And so in that same way that the film is Shakespearean, my, my conflict feels Shakespearean, like what will they think and what will the consequences be? I think Amy Adams is one of the great actors of all time. She couldn't have played Lynn if she judged her. She dialed into it, and I, I didn't even think of the fact that her and Christian have this great collaborative relationship. That was a whole added bonus that I had these two great collaborators that were able to work together. Women in New York City are burning their bras. <laughs> well, you know what uh, women in Wyoming do with our bras? We wear them! <laughs> Rumsfeld is a really important character. Rumsfeld just had a spark to him. And by all accounts, there doesn't seem to be an operating belief system in play. The leap that you have to try to make is what they might be like privately, because public persona is one thing, what you're projecting in front of an audience, as opposed to the person behind the scenes. And I always got the sense that Donald Rumsfeld came off almost like a kindly uncle. That doesn't give you a heart on, I don't know what will. Sorry to the few ladies in the room. Steve just right away picked up on that. And obviously, Steve and I have a long history, so that was a layup. It was just like, you know, Steve Carell has to do this. So when he was into it, I was thrilled. Steve Carell is absolutely wonderful, and many people have commented on, my God, they never thought they would have sympathy for Donald Rumsfeld, but by God, they did with Steve's portrayal of that. Don't worry, I'm like bed bugs. I have to burn the mattress to get rid of me. So I was able to just tell Steve, I was like, this is gonna be a blast. You're gonna have so much fun. Well, there goes the neighborhood. And there's a delicious quality with which Carell really embodies a certain kind of person. He makes bureaucratic warfare very delightful to watch somehow. It's sort of a terrifying pulling back of the curtain that so much power is contained within the walls of this White House. Essentially, what he's saying is, why would you want to be anywhere else. Are you even more ruthless than you used to be there, Dick? Are you just not getting laid? From the second I started writing the script, I was like, Sam Rockwell has to be Bush. I really thought about it, and that was the only name I kept coming up with, and I've been a fan of Sam's forever. Enough of that, guys. Sam Rockwell, who I first worked with, oof, man, we're talking about 25 years ago now, who is always extraordinary and is fantastic, who just came in, and on his very first day, we had one of the longest scenes uh, between George Bush and Cheney, and it's just brilliant. It's, 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 it's a grind. It's a grind, I'll tell you. I thought, you know, this is a tricky character because the real George W. Bush is a little bit of a comedic character. He's very extreme. If you're gonna pull this off, it has to be real and grounded, yet you can't be afraid of it being funny because the real George W. was, he just smoked it. He was incredible. I think that's an excellent idea. Sam Rockwell, I... I love him. There's a real joy to him as a performer. He's exciting to watch. He's creative and inventive. So listen, I got a lack of experience problem in the polls, and uh, you're one of the most experienced guys around. You wanna jump on board, be my vice? I gotta be honest, I never occurred to me to do Tyler Perry as Colin Powell. That was my agent, Ari Emanuel, called me and he goes, just meet with him. Playing Colin Powell was something I never thought I'd even attempt to do or even imagine, but when I talked to Adam, he convinced me that I could do it and he had seen Gone Girl and he thought, maybe this is something you should try. And I wanted to sink my teeth into it and do the best that I could. But anytime I get a chance to play someone so strong, so powerful, that is always very, very intriguing to me. Afghanistan is Al-Qaeda's headquarters, that is where our focus should be. Tyler Perry came in to play Colin Powell and I didn't even recognize him. And it's not as if he was under a ton of prosthetic makeup either. He just, by all intents and purposes, he was Colin Powell. I think maybe a genius stroke of casting. I can't even imagine anyone else playing that part. He has this gravitas to him and he's a big guy as well, but it's a quiet gravitas and he's an incredibly hard worker. The challenge with playing a real person is just that they're a real living being and people have references to see how close you came to that character. So what I try to do at this moment is just study him as much as I could, but also allow enough of myself inside of it because even though the story is based on a lot of truth, I don't know about his very intimate details of his life. So I had to, you know, take some liberties there. But it's always difficult when you're playing someone that is alive or, or has lived. You want to do best by them and you want to honor them as well. Carl, I have been very vocal 
very vocal about my reservations about evading Iraq. Oh, no, Colin, you're such a nervous Nelly. What's the exit strategy? You're what, what about the intelligence? The Has anybody tried? Strategy. Does the intelligence matter to you oh, at all? Please, you you're break wrong. it, you, you bought know it. You're wrong. You break you're it, just you a, bought it. One of the big central elements to the Cheney story is the family. So when we cast Mary and Liz, it was really important who played those roles. I think Mary being gay was a huge part of her family life. I mean, and, and remains a huge part of her family life. Mom, Dad, I like girls. I looked into Mary's life. It's always helpful when you're playing somebody who's written a memoir, definitely. I highly recommend. Alison Pill, she's just known as one of the great actresses working right now. And she was so perfect for Mary. And when she's betrayed by her sister and she cries in the end of the movie, it's like every time I watch it, I get teary-eyed. These calls went to every house in Wyoming. Every single house. I will never win. Lily Rabe, is uh, anyone who knows, is one of the great actresses working as well. She's amazing. She's done uh, three movies with us. I think she's just ferociously gifted. You know, I would say it's not her relationship that complicates her political ambitions. I would say it's her political ambitions that complicate her relationship with Mary. In order for the heartbreak of the ending to work, you really had to believe they were a family. So I just felt spoiled that I had those two actresses, Allison and Lily, playing those roles. You feel that they're sisters, that they're part of this family. You really feel that they operate as a unit. They are like, they're there together in the Oval Office as kids. They're there together by the, the family sort of lakeside. And then over the course of the story, as you get to know Liz Cheney and see her ambitions, and then you see what Mary Cheney seemed to care about in the direction her life took. They're so good that when we would shoot the family scenes, they would just fit right in with Christian and Amy, and it really felt like a family unit. We've been trying to, in these moments, find this sisterly relationship of how close are they for such seemingly temperamentally different people to grow up in the same family. What What is that like? Let me be very, very clear. I do not support gay marriage. We're barreling towards a movie that we're about to make, and Christian's like, if the makeup's not right, we can't do this, and I totally agree. I'll be like, of course we can. We all know that Christian Bale will put on weight. We all know that he will change his body. He lifted weights to get a strong neck, shaved his head, eyebrows, put on like 45 pounds. He did all that stuff. But then on top of it, we had to do makeup with the great makeup artist, Greg Canham. And the script's great, it jumps everywhere. He's 21, he's 63, he's 71, he's 40. It's just all over the place. I was like, wow, this is cool. So we just started doing tests. There was a point where I thought we hit the look. I thought we had it. And I was like, this looks really good, Christian. He goes, no, no, it can be better. And I was just like, mm. But I was just constantly pushing him, saying, eh, no, not quite there, not quite there. Sure enough, he came back and it was even better. It was just amazing. I was shocked. I just went, you were right. You know, this is how it should look. Poor Christian had to come in at like 4 a.m. and sit in a chair for four hours. And then he had to get out of the makeup every day. I mean, he was in a torturous hell. And they can be, shall we say. Fucking exhausting. It's a, quite a process because it, it's uh, a lot of appliances. This little piece in the center here is a tiny little tip just to make his nose look a little longer and thinner. And we start with that every day and then it's a whole uh, chin and neck piece and big cheek pieces and it's been great with him because it's a collaboration he's never once got angry or upset to then start your day after you've done all of that and to not be hampered by those tools acting underneath all that it felt like dick cheney was in the room and everyone around us had the same feeling like <laughs> this is the creepiest thing i've ever seen he summoned dick cheney it was it was an amazing thing to watch Half the room wants to be us, the other half fears us. Amy was much easier. Amy, we tried to do the big prosthetics, and then we realized, like, Lynn Cheney really doesn't look that different. Mine varied based on the age between, like, two and four hours. We had to go a subtle way with her, and it worked really well. 
we use old age stipple which is a rubber with gelatin and color in it and we stretch the skin powder it and you let it go and you get some nice wrinkles and she's got some great lines around here so we do that and pull that and accent those a lot and her eyes really wrinkle them up good look at this crap god damn it hello don there was no makeup for me i was able to manipulate my bone structure to create the character all right, well, we have work to do. That's real acting. With Carell, it was very tricky. Because Bale was so demanding, we had a different makeup artist on Carell. We had Adrian Moreau, who did an incredible job. There's a lot of trial and error to it because they just wanted it to look as real as it could be. Eventually, to Adrian's credit, he nailed it. The process was painstaking. They took great care, and there are a couple of different looks. There's a younger looking Donald Rumsfeld, and then you fast forward to the older statesman Rumsfeld. This. Iraq has all the good targets. I thought, wow, that actor looks just like Donald Rumsfeld. And I had to look at the call sheet. I thought, shit, it's Steve. Now, I've worked with Steve. I've met him several times. Didn't recognize him at all. Amazing. It's been amazing watching the transformation of the characters. It takes a lot of people to get to where it is, but we've all had a really great time and we have a dream team. There's nothing better when you get challenged like this. I'm phenomenally grateful to Greg and Chris and all of the team because they're as much a part of the performance as I am. period costumes that Susan Matheson designed are amazing. Susan Matheson manages to get at real authentic period detail while always remaining in the entertainment space. She's a force of nature. No one works harder. No one is more diligent. That looks better. OK, great. The first thought I had when I read the script was, wow, we're going to cover about 60 years in this film. And it's monumental. I still, to this day, don't get how she did it, going through six decades, having to dress extras, having to dress, you know, your primary people, the different fabrics, and uh, you look at the movie and it's just seamless. You would never guess the crazy amount of work she had to do. She will be relentless in tracking down the true details of what somebody wore, the shoes, the socks, the T-shirt. There are a lot of research pictures of the Chinese but there are really specific dates where we knew exactly what they were wearing. For example, on 9-11. So I wanted to make sure that 9-11, that the colors were right for each of the characters. But my goal throughout the movie has been to capture the essence of the characters. Well, we're not concerned, are we? Not at all. Christian Bale starts off very slim, and as he progresses with age, his size starts to change. So we had to not only make sure that the suits were period specific, but that also he would grow through time because Dick Cheney grew <laughs> physically through time. With Lynn Cheney, I found a lot of pieces all over the world. So one of my favorite outfits that she wears when she has dinner with the Rumsfelds was something I found in Cardiff, Wales, and it literally arrived on the day that we were shooting the scene. I wanted to capture how articulate she is as a woman. She's a very strong woman, but she's also very, very buttoned up. And so to make her look buttoned up, I gave her a lot of bows. So that's definitely a theme in her clothes throughout the film. No matter what time period she's in, you'll spot a bow. The other thing that's essential to her look is a lady suit with a brooch. She wore her own version of the power suit and they were quite colorful. If you have power, people will always try to take it from you. There were a monumental amount of costumes in this show. Dick Cheney alone has about 95 changes. I've never ever had a character changed that many times in a film. And Lynn Cheney had about 60 changes. So between those two characters alone, it was a monumental undertaking. And then we've got over 150 speaking parts. So it really felt like we were on warp speed and that I was running as fast as I could at all times. <laughs> Patrice Vermette is incredible. I mean, he's like at the highest level of what he does as a production designer. I actually did, like I do it every movie, it's the same process. I start collecting images, creating my little mood boards, and creating files. And at one point, I said, okay, well, this is file 
150. This is file 125. This is file 211. I'm like, whoa, okay, well, we've got that many sets. You're creating decades of American history. I mean, you're in the Senate, you're in the White House, you're in Afghanistan, you're in Iraq. We have the Supreme Court, the House of Representatives, Cambodia, Vietnam, Wyoming, Virginia, anything you could think of is in this. The challenge for Patrice was to create 50 years of history in Washington, all in Los Angeles. The craftiness with which he addressed this movie is just incredible. And really, at that point, it boils down to a certain artistic eye. You've got to be able to give the right slice of the image you need. There's a shot in the movie of Saddam's palace where they discover that really Saddam didn't have weapons of mass destruction. And you look at the shot and just what he did, there's an old piano in the foreground and a staircase in the background with rubble. And it just implies this giant cheesy palace in one slice of a set that he built. Every set we design needs to tell the story, needs to go beyond just the set being a set, right? It needs to hold a story like a good bass line or a good drum line. It's just about finding the extra detail that will help tell the story, even though sometimes it might be a bit subliminal. Like one of my favorite sets is actually for when they read the menu of the torture and the idea of using Nicolas the Poussin uh, paintings, which they look like super classic and inoffensive, but when you start looking at them, it's people being raped, beheaded. It's quite atrocious visuals. And uh, the floor arrangement, we say, hey, let's, let's put some skeletons in there. I've always liked to play with symbolism. That, that's when I really, really had fun with. Excellent choice, thank you. That kind of stuff just, it's hard to calculate how much that gives life to a movie. You look at the White House in this movie, I, I've never seen a White House design like this. It's truly breathtaking. We recreated the, a big part of the West Wing. And, uh, but the biggest challenge was to jump back and forth through time. Sometimes when we're finished shooting a certain scene, we would remodel those rooms to other rooms, like the Rumsfeld's first office, which is also Kissinger's office, which is also Cheney's second office. You just change the drapes, furniture, fast. It was a bit of a choreography. He also was incredible at collaborating with Greg Frazier, our DP. They spent weeks and weeks talking about the paint in the White House and how that would catch the light of the camera and was it dense enough. Best thing about Greg is he can like find the shot in one second. And what I love about Frazier is he's not handcuffed by a specific style. He follows the story and the movie we were able to mix in Super 8 and 16, and, and we use the real TV cameras for the period. So there's all these different formats in the movie, but all of it was always grounded by this beautiful 35 mil film look. He's simply one of the best DPs out there. How's my hair? We would joke, Hank Corwin and I, when we were in the edit room, we blame you, Greg Frazier, because everything he shot was so gorgeous looking that we couldn't give up the scenes. And you know, when you're editing, you have to cut stuff. I was absolutely stunned by what Hank Corwin, the editor, the dynamic between Adam and him is just phenomenal. There's an electricity to the combination of Adam and Hank as director and editor. Hot damn! The bold storytelling choices that Adam brings in both the script and how he directs, and when you pair that with how Hank and his unique eye and how he cuts and the multimedia type aspects of what he brings into the show, it comes alive. <laughs> Dick Cheney is a mystery. He is a hard nut to crack. <laughs> Hank and I had to go deep on this. If it got too linear, it started feeling tiring, like if you were just following history. That's not good. If it got too non-linear, it got confusing. <laughs> Let, let's slow down. There were just a lot of times where he and I had to look at each other and go, let's just keep trusting the process, keep trusting the process. Like, you have to try stuff, you have to fail, you have to have some success, follow the success. And what ended up resulting from it was this movie like nothing I've ever worked on that's an odd mixture of classical kind of old school cinema mixed with this really abstracted, strange kind of modern cinema. Anytime you've got the Einstein hair, it helps, and the glasses, and the aw shucks attitude. I call him the Columbo of editors, because he's always like, oh, one more thing, and then his one more thing changes everything. I think
think everyone has to admit where we're at is very different and very extreme. And I don't think we know exactly how we got where we're at. To me, it's undeniable to hold up a mirror to yourself in those moments and consider how much have you changed without realizing it. Yeah. Good times. What I really would want people to look at is just the nature of power. And what do you do with that power? I'm just doing my job. Go fuck yourself. Human beings aren't meant to have this much power. There's a reason we built our government the way we did with checks and balances. This film is a revelation in showing how connected we are to our past. We're going down the same path if we're not careful. I'm president. I want this to happen. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <sighs> we keep repeating ourselves, don't we? I think nowadays there's so much information, so much misinformation, so much partisan back and forth going on in the world that I think it's confusing to people. No matter what side you're on, there is a hope that the movie can help provide some context and understanding to how we got here. The beauty of film is you can interpret it however you want. So someone could tell me that's wrong, even though I made it. I'm all right, fair enough. You are the president. As you realize that Dick Cheney really was the guy who set the table for where we're at now, it became much more of a dark tragedy and also much more of a, a dark comedy. I mean, it really is entertaining. And within that entertainment, incredible poignancy. This is the story of how we got to where we're at. You chose me. And I did what you asked.